The topic I'll be speaking on today is the relationship between data science and DevOps. But before I really start, I wanted to just kind of see maybe a raise of hands. How many people are familiar with DevOps or have heard of it, get an inkling of it? Okay. How many people don't know what operations is? What I'm saying when I say operations. A few people. Okay. Um, so I'll cover that a little bit then once I start. But I'm Kyle Snavely. I'm with uh, IBM Cloud, a database service uh, at IBM. And I'm a software engineer. I use that label uh, because it's very generic. I have a lot of roles at Cloud. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about my engineering journey. Uh, and then we'll speak on that relationship between data and DevOps. You know, when I talk about my journey, I'll describe what DevOps means to me. It means to my team. And then we'll uh, walk through a, an example tool I've built kind of in the DevOps uh, culture using data science techniques uh, to, to drive a little bit more insight from the data we have at Cloud. And then we'll close it off. Uh, so before I get started, I'll, I'll cover the basics I just took that uh, round of hands for. Um, if you hear somebody, a software engineer especially, or a software-oriented company talking about operations, usually what they're referring to is engineers that are managing the deployment, managing the status of a running service or a product as a customer uses it. So these are people that are going to be paged in the middle of the night if the website goes down, right? Or if your database has high latency, you're going to get a page at 2 a.m. That's operations. Now contrast that with development, um, where traditionally we're talking about engineers who are just developing software and almost in a closed box, you can think about it, right? So they, they create the software, they make a release, it's a gold disk, and they hand it to the operations team, and they do the thing. That's the background. Let's go back to me. So Jenny mentioned kind of an interesting tidbit about my past. I, I actually wasn't a software engineer initially. I always wanted a career in software, but my education and background is actually in experimental physics. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a really interesting field. And I, I wanted to show this picture to you just because it brings up warm memories, but also because this is quite a complex system, no? Uh, what this is is a, is a cryostat that houses semiconductor detectors for the Majorana experiment. And there's a lot going on here. I mean, there's a, there's a vacuum sensor. You know, somebody designed this, this vacuum cryostat housing. Uh, we've got all of these wires going to detectors. So what's really going on is this de entire design is being driven by data, right? And so data is kind of giving us the description for a solution to this complex problem. And as I move from physics to software engineering, it's data that kind of remains the commonality. Make sense? And a lot of people tell me that's a curious path to take from physics to software, but I don't think so. And I'm willing to bet that this audience probably doesn't think so. When you're solving a complex physics problem, you're doing the same thing that you do for an engineering problem, or a software problem. You're breaking it down with analytic reasoning, and you're examining the problem data, such that you understand the problem sufficiently to find a solution. So data is a common ground linking these fields and other fields. And we must well understand our data to enact an effective solution. So this is my physics back in the day. Kind of got tired of working a mile underground in a mine for like 10 hours straight. Um, so I jumped a uh, jump ship and I joined Cloud as a Python developer. So, Cloud, what is this thing I've been talking about? Well, Cloud is a database service. So it's an always on managed database service that, that's offered by IBM written by folks like me, operated by folks like me. Uh, and, and Cloud was acquired in IBM in 2014, which is kind of what brings me in front of all of you today. Um, Cloud, you can think of as a, you know, Amazon Dynamo version of Apache CouchDB. So it exposes a very similar interface, almost exactly the same as Apache CouchDB, but it offers features like clustering, sharding, data replication, things like that. And, uh, you know, we have thousands of machines across the globe, hundreds of clusters. So, and across multiple data centers, data providers, 
you know, we've got legacy data centers, we've got brands making new ones, all kinds of stuff. And what this means is that cloud is an exercise in operating distributed systems. And that's extremely difficult. You know, it's enough to deal with one machine running out of disk space, but it's an entirely different problem when that data is associated with another replica data set on machines that are communicating over a network, serving customers, and maintaining themselves at the same time. It's a huge pain. And so cloud was kind of my first exposure into what it takes to really operate a global service. And uh, I'm really lucky to have joined this team because I think they do an excellent job. You know, Cloud tries to embrace customer challenges. We want the service to work for the customer. And it's also where I started to maybe understand DevOps, even before I, I knew what the term was. Because there are engineers at Cloud that kind of embody that spirit of DevOps. And I've been fortunate to work alongside them. OK, so we've made it to the buzzword stage. Uh, I hate buzzwords. I think uh, as an engineer, they devalue what you actually do day to day. But there is, I think, some value in this term and, and maybe the awareness of this term. So back in the day, what DevOps originally was kind of seen as was breaking down that wall between the development group and the operations group that I've described. Right? If you're throwing a gold disk over the wall and then they're trying to run that in production, trying to understand what kind of bugs are happening, it's just been proven not to work that well. And for a lot of teams, breaking down those barriers, combining those people and knowledge of development and operations has proven to be very effective uh, for uh, bettering their product or service. And there's, there's a few components to DevOps. You know, at, at the kind of Vegas level, I like to think about it as a culture. It's one that encourages collaboration across teams, you know, cross-functional teams, as well as just knowledge sharing and over-communication between those teams. Um, and then another part of it, and I think perhaps the most important part, is the people. If you have an engineering culture that embraces that knowledge sharing and uh, communication, and you have engineers that understand the software development lifecycle, as well as the responsibilities and the knowledge required to manage an offering, uh, the team will go very far. And when you have that culture and those people, naturally you kind of get, I think, what a lot of people think about with DevOps, which is the ease of rapid iteration or adopting agile process for your team. Okay? And, and there's a few other big things too, like embracing continuous automation. I mean, that's a huge thing we'll get back to. Um, but it can be super simple. I mean, you see infographics online that will go on for pages about DevOps, and it's just a waste of space. You know, when I think about DevOps, I think about maybe, you know, a database engineer, and, and she's been, you know, working on CouchDB for years. Uh, but now she's a cloud, and she wants to contribute to the operations organization. So this person is moving out of their comfort zone, perhaps on their own time, learning things like Chef or configuration management, or maybe just, you know, system management skills, learning to be a sysadmin. But then when she goes back to her database programming, I can guarantee you she has a fuller understanding of the context in which her software is going to be running. And she'll understand exactly what it means, uh, the importance of our service operating all the time. And it really does change the way you, you code. <clears throat> On the flip side, you have operators that benefit from this culture. I think sometimes maybe it's ops that benefits the most. Maybe, it, maybe somebody's going to get mad at me for saying that. But, you know, I picture somebody maybe has just finished their education. They have a background of a system administrator or perhaps an infrastructure engineer. Um, but they start to pick up, you know, software engineering skills. So now instead of, you know, solving problems maybe manually on the command line, they're reaching out to tools, they're, they're improving these tools, the tools are shared between teams and the organization, and it's you know, effectively a force multiplier for their ability to operate the service. Um, I mean, and, and these are examples I'm giving you, but these are things I have seen happen and have a positive impact on, on everybody on the team. And so, the second part of this, how is DevOps driven by data? Why am I talking to you today? 
Well, I, I posit that both operations and development uh, have data at their core, and they have to understand that their data to make decisions uh, every day. So maybe let's look a, a little bit closer at cloud, because I'll be using these data sources in an example uh, in a few minutes. Well, we have a lot of data at cloud. We might not be petabyte scale, uh, but for instance, Splunk we use. If you're not familiar, Splunk is a, a log aggregation engine. That's a very simplistic description. It offers some pretty advanced features, some alerting, uh, and we push uh, nearly a terabyte of logs to Splunk a day from our service. That's a lot of data to make a decision from. Uh, we use Fogbugs, which is like a work management system. You might be kind of curious. Fogbugs, a ticket system, as it's not really returning numerical data, but the data can be useful, and I'll give an example of that later. And finally, Graphite. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's the most important data source. Uh, maybe they're all important. Uh, but Graphite is our system metrics storage engine, I'll say for lack of a better term. It also exposes some pretty advanced features in terms of querying data and basic operations you can perform on data. And I think we pull in uh, 12 gigabytes a day of system metrics data. Not a terabyte of logs, but still a good chunk. And so developers will use these sources while uh, developing a feature. You know, they might be tracking their work in a ticket or trying to understand how a customer has been using or misusing an existing feature by examining logs. Now, of course, operations, they're going to live and die by these, right? If you get an incident at 2 a.m., you are opening metrics and you are opening Splunk to figure out what's going on. And in any, organiza in any organization, you know, the interactions with the service of their product is going to be governed by observations of their computing environments, application metrics, system logs. And we can do a lot with these data sources, right? I mean, I assure you, Cloudants work really hard to do their job. Uh, for instance, Splunk offers a lot of features on its UI. You can do some pretty advanced searching uh, as long as you can pay the Splunk bill. And we've built monitoring and alerting on top of Graphite. That's why I said perhaps it's the most important system we have. It's going to be the thing that it pages you when, when disk usage is slow or when you've run out of memory on a machine. But in the course of you know, my career as a developer, an operator, just a guy with a lot of hats at cloud, I started to see some inefficiencies in how we use these data sources. And you know, part of that's driven you know, perhaps by uh, an operations process where you're, you know, you're constantly engaging with systems issues and customer tickets. I mean, I mentioned we have thousands of machines. Something's always failing. It's just a continuous state of hardware failure, right? There's nothing you can do about it. Um, but when an issue occurs, you know, people are considering these data sources separately. You've got your Splunk tab open. You've got your Graphite tab open. Maybe our advanced metrics web page does some, some extra special stuff. But you know, it's a human kind of piecing this data together on the fly, trying to understand you know, what, what's the context of this incident? What portion of the system has failed in a way that we were alerted or that the customer is complaining? And uh, you know, I think that we can dive a little deeper. I mean, this is just data, right? I mean, that's data. But Splunk and, and Graphite, <laughs> those guys are dated too. Um, so maybe let's look a little deeper here. And now, uh, before I continue, does everyone feel a little bit more comfortable about DevOps and operations? OK, like two nods. Sounds good. <laughs> That's a pretty good response from a conference audience. All right. So they've got me at cloud doing all these things, and sometimes I I get a bit naughty and I do something like a small research project, right? So a few years ago, I was kind of working intensively with a lot of large customers trying to figure out how we can improve our capacity planning in cloud. So this means, you know, you're a client of ours and you expect your user base to grow over the next two years. Well, the predictions of the growth of your company are going to drive the investments you make in terms of something like a data service, right? You're paying money for things like disk space, uh, you know, request operations. And when you get down to the bottom of it, we're talking about machines, right? You're talking about hard drives, RAM, all that good stuff. You know, although as a service, 
you hide that from the customers as much as possible. When's the last time you know you saw a disk usage alert from Gmail, right? Um, and I've had this previous experience kind of as a scientist. So I, I'd used some of these tools before, years ago. And uh, luckily, many members of the cloud and team are actually kind of ex-scientists. Maybe disgruntled, maybe not, I don't know. A lot of physicists there, it's <laughs> kind of suspicious. Um, but we basically developed a tool to dive a little deeper into things like Splunk and Graphite. And uh, it's still kind of an ongoing research project, but there are a lot of people in my organization excited about this. Um, so I've called this thing Forecast. And what it is is an analysis engine. What it does is novel things that our current data sources aren't capable of, right? Things like Splunk and Graphite and Fogbugs, they all expose APIs that we can fetch data from. And by putting them on a common, uh, common well, I'll say a, a common language like Pandas, right? Now we've eliminated the, the impedance mismatch between, say, our Splunk logs and our graphite data. And because we can pull in things like NumPy or whatever scientific programming uh, Python library you want, you can do some pretty advanced analyses, right? Basically, anything you can do in Python, you can alert on. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, and then also, I, I pulled a Jupyter and Matplotlib for some visualization. You know, Forecast is an engine. It doesn't really make graphs. It just gets data, chews on it, and sends that data somewhere else. But I use Jupyter and Matplotlib uh, for development, and it's awesome. Of course, you all know that. Now, I'm going to demonstrate some things that Forecast can do. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to be simple, but they're going to be powerful. You know, those tools are so easy to use. You know, we've got tutorials in this conference that teach you the basics in an hour and a half. They could radically change how you, you know, do your job as a data scientist or do your job as an engineer. Um, and, and this is where that marriage between DevOps and data becomes really powerful because we can take those tools and we can put them in something like an automated monitoring system, okay? And that can be uh, super powerful. You know, for instance, one problem we have in operations is false positives, right? Your CPU just spiked to 99%. So what? I paid for that CPU. I'm glad to utilize it, right? But maybe that 99% CPU uh, bit usage is correlated with some other poor behavior. Maybe your database isn't responding. Now it's not a false positive, right? Uh, and because we're pulling in those logs from Splunk, we can go beyond what Splunk can do. And now Splunk offers some pretty advanced features. Um, but you're still kind of locked into that UI. If you wanted to do something really radical with that data, you have to wait for Splunk to do it or write some kind of plugin yourself. Uh, but because we already have a lot of Python at cloud that describes our service, it's a service library layer, uh, we just decided we'd use these tools and pull the data into a central location. Uh, one example of how you could use this engine is in an incident response system. So if a manager gets paged at 1 a.m. because the customer is very upset, they could press one or two buttons and have forecasts, look at the last week of cluster health, right, and start to pick out what might be bad behaviors and give operations some pointers on where to look. Um, and this is where I think Fogbugs could be very useful because I think we all have a good grasp of how to look through numerical data, but in this incident management scenario, it would be also really useful to say, look at the dates and times of every ticket opened by that customer during the support, uh, support time, right? Then you can compare those ticket opening times to uh, any bad behavior you found in metrics. And that'll give you maybe a little bit more complete understanding for something like an RCA, which is very important. Uh, or another example, perhaps my favorite, will is kind of a predictive application. That's what one of my examples would go into, but by having forecasts running in an automated way, we can do some simple analysis all the time over all of our metrics or whatever metrics we're interested in. So we can do things like warn uh, a manager or their client months before an issue is going to become critical. Okay, And we'll examine that case in just a moment. So data scientists they sure do love to abuse databases. But that's okay. 
operations job security, perhaps. But disk space as an operator is one of my biggest pet peeves. Such a simple problem. Disk space is a limited resource, right? Don't put too much data on disk. And when you run out of disk space, it becomes a huge pain in the ass. I mean, systems start to behave very strangely when they can't write to the files they expect. Uh, and not only that, but the incidents, you know, running out of disk space or coming near to running out of disk space cost a lot more to manage as that incident becomes more critical. You know, if you're warned two months ahead of time that you're going to run out of disk, that's great. Your salespeople can engage a customer and probably upsell them or whatever, you know, you need to do for your product. But if you wait until the 11th hour and the customer's application is no longer performing correctly in the middle of the night, they're going to be pissed off and it's going to cost you a lot more time, money, engineers, and customer trust to fix that problem. So how can data science help? Well, this will be my first example of the day for forecast. Let me switch over to my, uh, my Python notebook. Okay. The code's not so important, but can you guys generally get the gist of that? So the first thing we're going to look at is what I call a disk report from forecast. And what forecast is doing is it's using graphite to examine the disk free on a cluster. Pretty basic stuff. And this is kind of, uh, this is forecast's language right here. It's a, a configuration file. It's Python dict here, but I like to think of it as more of a JSON blob. I'm kind of an HTTP API person. And we've done some uh, simple things here. We've specified the cluster we're interested in. I've picked uh, just a major multi-tenant cluster. Um, and I've also specified a few analyses for forecast to do. The first is a linear fit, which is something that Graphite can do. But we get a little bit more information from NumPy. You know, we can get parameters, uh, regression numbers. We can do something other than linear fit if we feel like it. And I'm also asking forecast to give us a prediction for when this cluster, when the nodes in the cluster are going to run out of disk space. Okay, now this is an approximation. This is a linear fit on real data. But I think it's very informative. So let's go ahead and uh, I've already run all these because it's a, it's a death trap to try to do it during conference. Um, so after asking forecast to process the report, it just gives us back more JSON. It's got the original configuration in there as well as uh, the data, fit data, uh, fit parameters, end of disk data, you know, whatever you've asked for. And, uh, you know, one operation method for forecast is just to sh shove that in a database and we'll check it out if it's relevant. Uh, but we're going to check it out right now. We're going to visualize it with matplotlib. Okay. Beautiful graph, by the way. I love systems data. It's just it's so amazing. I mean, I've seen so much physics data in my time. It's just beautiful interactions with nature. And then, you know, you log into metrics during some horrible incident and the customer's pissed and you just see some awesome data. You know, yeah, all right. So this is awesome data, sort of, because it's trending down at a, a precipitous rate. Uh, but the great thing is, you know, we fit this with our linear regression, and forecast has predicted when the nodes in this cluster are going to run out of disk space. This doesn't take very long either. I mean, this is three months of data, and I think forecast probably processes this in, you know, three seconds on my laptop or something. So on a real machine, that's you can do this over hundreds of clusters, thousands of clusters if you need to. Weekly basis is fine. This is low frequency monitoring, right? But this is something that our real-time monitoring system is not capable of doing. And if you have a monitoring system running on forecasts that can access information like this, you know, when a cluster is going to run out of disk, that's extremely powerful. I mentioned, you know, we're automating this over all of our clusters. And you can imagine those clusters are associated with clients that have salespeople, technical account managers. Well, if forecast sees something like this for a cluster, it can send the, a soft warning out to the team. You know, it'll chat the operations team on Slack right before their team meeting and say, hey, this cluster is uh, going to be in a bad state in about a month or two. You should really take a look. That's a lot uh, better in terms of planning what your operations engineers are going to be doing than getting a page when it hits 90% and suddenly it's a priority. Okay. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's so simple, right? Linear regression. But this is an extremely powerful uh, capability for a monitoring service to have. I'm going to flip back to my slideshow. Try to flip back. All right. That was pretty simple. It was cool, but simple. 
Uh, but I got a lot more data than disk usage, right? With more data comes more problems. Okay. I mentioned, you know, one thing we're not capable of doing in a programmatic way today is comparing data sets from Splunk and Graphite easily. But of course, that's extremely important because you want to time correlate any issues, right? So I've got an example of disparate data sets here that, and I'm going to try to demonstrate the importance of, of correlation. And I'm, I'm under uh, no impression that correlation equals causation for any of these examples. So this is radar imagery. And you're probably, most of you are familiar with the top one, radar reflectivity of objects in, in the environment. Uh, the darker the color, the more radar has been reflected. So you're talking about water and dust and birds. Um, and down here we have a wind shear map, which is uh, showing us in red and green, you know, whether the wind is moving away or towards the radar source uh, in, in sort of a radial fashion. And what we're doing here is looking for signs of tornadoes, right? Tornadic activity. But the problem is you can't, you know, just rely, say, on this top data set, right? These features that are circled are certainly indicative of a tornadic event, but on their own, they're, you know, not entirely meaningful, right? You wouldn't go warn a county of 300,000 people if you saw this on your radar screen. But when we combine this data set with the wind shear, and we see behavior such as this, low-level convergence or cyclonic behavior, combined with our reflectivity data, now we do understand the problem, and we know that we can go alert people with confidence. That we're not giving them a false positive, and that we better understand what's happening meteoro meteorologically. And uh, I put the link for where this came from down below. It's kind of cool. I recommend it. So in complex systems, we have to rationalize uh, multiple data sources, or maybe multiple uh, sets of data from one source. OK? And it's often operations uh, that has to do this, right? They're looking through these signals, through the, through the radar imagery, trying to figure out, is this a tornado? Is this a hurricane? Is this nothing? And using forecast, we can make these kinds of comparisons. Okay. Mouse go. All right. Let's zip down to the next example. It's going to be a little bit more complex, uh, but nothing too crazy. I mentioned CPU and latency before. That's often correlated together during an incident. Uh, so let's explore that space. Here's a forecast config for this. It's similar to that disk usage report, except I'm requesting uh, CPU information and latency information. And the, my favorite thing about this is that these are two different data sources, right? This is Graphite and this is Splunk. So this is something we couldn't do before. Uh, and I've specified uh, an analysis on both of these, what I call a peak threshold analysis or a, you know, a slow request analysis. And all it's looking for is events where we've exceeded a threshold. You know, anytime your CPU's gone above 97%, or anytime your latencies are above three seconds, it's going to log that event. And then it does one extra step. Uh, it also investigates for any time spans with multiple events. Uh, I forget, what did I use here? Six, 600 seconds, so that's 10 minutes. It's looking for any time that multiple events have happened in 10 minutes. And that's uh, maybe especially informative, so we'll keep track of those time spans. And we do that uh, for CPU as well as latency. So it's a very similar generic analysis. So we go ahead and ask forecast for this data. It goes and fetches it for us. We'll use some sweet matplotlibbing. All right, let me zoom down to the data first. So this is uh, you know, a week of CPU utilization from this cluster. Uh, and lots of interesting behavior. Um, perhaps nothing that I would stand out and jump up and down about. You know, if I was looking at this data manually, trying to maybe understand why an incident's recurring, I'd definitely be investigating. You know, say DB1, it's got these interesting kind of CPU humps. But you know, utilization is one of those things, like I mentioned, where you know, you're paying for all of it. So it's OK if you're using most of it, all of it. But you know, once you start hitting the wall, game over. So let's look at some of the analysis results. And so these are time spans in, in Unix epoch time uh, for these various database nodes 
in which they've exceeded that 97% CPU utilization threshold within 10 minutes. And you'll see a very similar thing for latency, and this is going to become kind of our, our uh, comparison measure for correlating events between these two data sources. Okay, let's take a look at latency. Uh, this is going to be a lot of data. And I don't want anybody to get too hung up on these data sets. Um, I was really just trying to demonstrate these abilities and finish this talk on time. So this is an example of latency percentiles as, as we get from Splunk. I filtered out a lot of requests that are kind of internal to our service. This is maybe what a customer would see. Of course, everyone's using the database differently. So there's a lot of different requests going on here. But the important things I look for on ops would be the 99.9% uh, latency percentile, as well as maybe the 99% latency percentile. So these are going to be kind of, you know, the first inklings of an impact on your service. A first uh, a hint that your requests are starting to slow down, your customers are going to be unhappy as their applications become unresponsive, and you're going to have to engage this operational incident. And just like the CPU example, I gave, we've got these uh, time spans for where we violated the threshold of, of three seconds, okay? And now here's kind of the special sauce. Let's compare these data sets. You know, these time spans are the same types of information, and so it, it's actually pretty trivial. Uh, and indeed, I filtered out some of this data. I can't remember um, just because there's a lot of it. So for this presentation, let's check out DB1, and it's 99.9% latency percentiles. Each of these time spans represents an overlap in the detection of multiple incidents in either data source. And so what Forecast is telling us here is that there's some kind of interesting property between CPU and latency right now. And if I'm an operator using Forecast, I can use something like this to, to narrow down where my investigation is. Um, and it's not just CPU and, and latency. Any data source we can pull into forecasts and describe in units of time spans, we could do this sort of correlative analysis for. And I think this will be one of forecasts' more powerful features. When I spoke about that incident management response tool, this is the sort of thing I'm envisioning. You know, we can do this analysis for memory, disk ops, and latency and see if maybe it's a file system cache issue that's causing our problem. We can do CPU and latency, or we can do uh, a network and anything else. Um, so this is very cool. And then I've got a little visualization. I had a heck of a time trying to get this to look good for you guys, but I wanted to give you a brief example. So here's a, the latency and CPU data sets overlapped. Okay, and then here's the horrible part. Here's a graph of each of these time spans. Okay, so unfortunately it's not going to be super easy to compare, but if you guys can remember where those were, you can see we definitely have you know, some bad behavior from latency correlating with some of these higher CPU peaks. Okay, correlation is not causation, but it's definitely more informative than say, uh, I'm going to step away from the mic. These two peaks right here, these latency peaks that are sticking up, that's not correlated with, you know, any CPU issues, and vice versa. We're definitely getting pretty high on the CPU graph at times here, but it's not impacting our latencies. So this is good information. I'm going to switch back to my slides. There we go. Okay. So that was forecast. It's a simple tool. It's kind of still ongoing. Uh, I'm, I'm the primary developer, but everyone is very excited about the possibilities of this tool. It's not just about DevOps still, all right? And I'm speaking to you as an engineer, and my experiences as an engineer are shaping the way that I've communicated these topics, or this topic to you. But you're all primarily data scientists, so besides you know, me saying data science is cool, what I want to get out of this for you guys is to understand that you can adopt some elements of the DevOps culture as data scientists and perhaps you know, make your own process more effective. And that comes with a clear, leave the buzzword at the door. Maybe you don't even have an ops team in your organization, right? But the culture of knowledge sharing and collaboration is, uh, is you know, without a, a bound on, on who you're talking about there. You know, and if you're talking, and if maybe you're a pure data scientist and your organization has some developers, yeah, go sit with them, talk about their application, do code review together, you know, get that knowledge sharing going on, and no matter 
you know, what the domain is, it's, it's going to improve. And then finally, uh, one of the most important lessons of DevOps is automation. So if any of you are doing some kind of repetitive task, and I know I've been there as a physicist working with, you know, IPython notebooks. Okay, I'll just do this analysis. I'll just do this one by hand. And like 10 more later, you're done, right? Well, if you had written a tool to automate some of that process for you, you might have been able to save a lot of time. And it's also something that you could then later build on, um, which is, you know, maybe the most powerful part. You know, as your team comes together, you start to grow an ecosystem of tools that allow you to much more effectively manage whatever it is that you're doing. So, DevOps. I think it's proven itself to be very effective for a lot of teams out there. And I hope that I've demonstrated today that data science tools and techniques can only help to further, you know, that goal. So that's all I had today. Thank you all very much.